pack, and all of a sudden there's graffiti lettering on the cover. Right, before it's that, like the, 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 even the image in New York was still kind of clean before right. that. When, when you did Wolf Pack, now all of a sudden everybody had to step up their reality, and they started putting graffiti in the background on the walls. And, and that, and and that broke down a lot of walls, because after that, you get the lettering on covers of right. all sorts of things. Lots of graffiti influence in Marvel Comics art. And by 1991, Kid and Play have their own Marvel comic. And then in the Wolfpack, is, the, the Wolfpack on the cover, they look like Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, kind of like all decked out and they're ready to rock. Actually, here, I'm going to hand you the mic, Ron. That leads into another good question, one for you. You worked on Marvel books in an era of transition for the company. I mean, one could argue that all eras are eras of transition, but um, also you brought a really unique sensibility to the work. Um, you had Frank Miller's Daredevil, which was like a sort of mythologized, pulp New York, but you didn't see any real New York in the books before that. So, I mean, it might not have been perfectly accurate, but they were code-approved comics. It was a sea change from what came before. Um, so what was that like with you working in that system? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, it's a pleasure sitting in with the rap legends, comic book artists that all seek to interwoven and hip-hop things in comic books. And when you're sitting around in your house and you listen to Grandmaster Flash, Furious Five, don't push me. Of course, I'm close to the edge. <laughs> you know, it just it, I was just inspiring. I know I had to get some type of I always wanted to do hip hop characters in comics. But that was sort of, uh, you know, I worked for Marvel for hire, so I had to pay bills. So they found my work was, they found my work was best doing the thing, the Incredible Hulk, which coincided with the TV show, Lou Perigno. I did Power Man. So, uh, you know, I was a little kid and I did what I was told to do. It was a pleasure to see these artists like John Persimmer. I never saw Jack Kirby once, I saw him out in, San Diego. When I saw him in San Diego, I was so scared to meet him because he had this white hair and olive colored skin. And he had this entourage that would follow him everywhere he went. So I told Joe Rubenstein to, hey, can you introduce me to Jack Kirby? And Joe said, sure. So he went over there, said a few words to Jack Kirby. And when Jack Kirby turned around, he almost like parted the Red Sea like Moses. <laughs> and when he came toward me, my heart started to beat. It was thumping. So he took both of his hands, clapped his hands with mine. He said, just do it your way, son. Just do it your way. That was, most, that was my most memorable moment in comics, meeting the king. All right, um, so for D, since D, Mr. DMC, Daryl's gonna need to leave early. So another question for you. Uh, you said comics are a huge influence on you, and now it sort of comes full circle. You have a project of your own that you're working on. Yes, um, I hope to do. I hope to produce and develop. Well, I hope to develop and produce and put out a superhero. For real, like for real, real, real. And um, you know, it's funny because people would always approach me for, and it's, it's weird that it took 25 years, but I guess I had to educate myself first, you know, because I was always into comics, but you know, what does it really take to do a successful comic? What does it really take to have an impact on a, a community and to create an audience? What does it really take to have a legendary, historical, um, you know, history-making comic book character like? You know, the Hulk, Iron Man, Captain America, Superman, and Batman. So for years, people was always, you know, telling me, DMC, you know, you need to do a, you know, hip-hop comic, and a rap comic, and you know, this and that. And two significant things happened. Um, Chris Rock, I think it was like five years ago at Rolling Stone. Chris Rock, they, you know, they asked him about Run DMC, and he was like, yeah, I love Run DMC. But I always loved DMC, man, because, you know, with the glasses and the hat and the gloves and the gold chain and stuff like that, he looked like a superhero. He was like my superhero. And then it struck me. I was like, oh, that's it. That's it. Maybe I can be the superhero. <laughs> People said I'm a superhero. I mean, they've been saying it. And a guy named Bill Adler, who was one of our early publicists, 
he had did the first autobiography of Run DMC, and he was like, you know, yeah, you know, Run DMC, Run and Jay were cool, but for some reason I always liked DMC. And the funny thing is, everything that I did artistically as an artist, subconsciously, it was me taking all that direction and intention from my comic books. Because number one, if you listen to all my raps, Crash through walls, come through floors, bust through sit. Like when Run told me ride a rhyme, I ain't, listen, I ain't sell drugs. I ain't never been in jail. I ain't get shot. That shit hurt. I like my family. <laughs> so when Run said, D, you got a rhyme, everything that was in me had to come out. So if you listen to my rhyme, the microphone master, the devastated mic controller, and now as I look back on all of that, Everything that I verbally, I cut the, listen, I was to the point where, you know, most rappers are talking about, yeah, I'll punch you in the face and I'll shoot you. But I was like, in a fantasy world, I was like, one, of the, one dude told me, um, man, the greatest rhyme I ever heard was I cut the head off the devil and I'll throw it at you. <laughs> all of that, if you go listen to my rhymes, all of that stuff came from the comic books. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to create a, a, a superhero that is going to be definitive of the lives that, the, every life, my life and every life that I've been living, and maybe lives before me, that I've encountered on this Run DMC journey. Because when you think about it, there's still a lot, of, a, a, lot of, a lot of things out here for us to fight. So I'm going to just take that DMC character, I mean, it's, technically it's not a character, but when I look back at it, I have a good blueprint to create a successful, you know, comic book where, like, I don't think you should make a hip-hop comic, or I don't think you should make a rap comic. I think when you set out to create something, you should just set out to, to create a good comic book overall. But what the thing that's going to make my comic a hip hop comic book is my whole life, my whole culture, my whole religion is hip hop. So those elements will be in there. Over the years, I've encountered, encountered people from here all the way over to Japan. Um, and the concept is a little different because it's a hip hop con concept is not of earthly origin but yet it has everything to do with Earth because I am true and loyal to the birthplace of hip hop, New York City, the undisputed birthplace of hip hop. So uh, it all starts from the core of New York, but uh, what I'm saying is what if other civilizations, other races, other aliens were rapping and have watched us rap over the years? Um, what I'm working on is I'm trying to revive this and uh, get it back on. So anybody out there that knows what's going on, you know, inform me because I've been in the, the music game with these cats for a long time, but this is my baby right here. Um, Our time is up, so oh, super quick. Okay. Sorry, I just want to give everyone a chance to step in. I did the color cover of the Village Voice coming out this Wednesday. <laughs> um, I'm doing a digital comic book series. Uh, LP album where I'm producing all the beats and um, um, Watch the Throne is my latest uh, uh, production out there and uh, Robert Glasper who's a jazz pianist yeah. who's number one on the chart and, uh, My superpower will be making a billion beats in half a millisecond <laughs> I got the uh, Public Enemy graphic novel, but I also have a brand new CD called Family First. It's out now. I'm working on a new album with uh, Juice here. And I just uh, finished the Craig G album cover, the Public Enemy album cover, and a bunch of others that you can check for it. The Bumpy Knuckles collection album cover. All right. Johnny? All right, I produced two Public Enemy albums in the past four months. They're both out right now. We got nominated for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I just got nominated for I'm producing eight albums right now, including one from These of the New School. I'm doing a Cold Crush Brothers album. I'm doing a Fearless Four album. And I'm, I'm, I don't know, what, what am I not doing? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, 
uh, two albums out before the end of the year. One is Gotham Down, the second one is Cake of Death. They both deal with a lot of time travel and shit. There's a lot of videos. The video kill screen is out now. I'll be directing and editing everything and show Life of Genies coming out and probably a com full comic book, but uh, Mike Hawthorne will be doing all the artwork, so it's going to be pretty good. All right, and one more break. Black Dynamite's in reruns. I'm doing, I'm working on a gratuitous ninja animation. Um, I'm actually making a hot jazz uh, EP that's basically making fun of the Joker and Batman. Uh, my show, my uh, show is in Bushwick, November 6th at the Super Chief Gallery. Uh, all right. Okay, meet us afterwards.